Hello, my name is Sean Ennis from Ennis Management, and thank you for joining me here again on the Creative Collective. And today I'm honored to be joined by a very special guest. He's a songwriter, drummer, engineer, and producer from Salem, Ohio, Jesse Henseroff. Hello, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Now, I usually start by asking the musicians that I speak with to tell me about the music climate in, in their home city or hometown, but this is a really unique experience for me because you've toured in Europe, Canada, and across the U.S. So I actually want to start with, can you talk about the experience of performing overseas in Europe? Oh yeah, it's been a great experience. The first time that we ever played over there was 2015, I believe, or 2005, my bad, so yeah, time's kind of got out of, so yeah, it's been a great experience, first time we ever played over there, we got to go to Nice, France, which is kind of a British resort in the south of France, and they would run us at a club called Wayne's Bar, and they'd run us for a whole week straight, so there wasn't as much traveling back then, you were at the same place the whole time. We also got to really learn the city. But then after that, we performed like in Paris and Milan, Italy, some other places. And but lately, it's been a lot of UK, like Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds, and Burnley, and some other places too. Hard to remember all the time, but great experiences. Now, that's really incredible for an independent band to be touring in Europe in all those different places. Can you talk about how you guys were able to achieve achieve that? Yeah. Actually, the first time that we ever had the opportunity, I was just surfing around on the internet, and I came across on a message board. It was a booking agency out of London, England, and they were basically looking for a band to play over in France because they had a band recently cancel on them and stuff, and they really needed to fill it. So I'm just like, oh. I wrote them back and said, yeah, we'd be interested. And next thing I realized, they had set everything up with you know, the flights all taken care of and all that. And so that was the first time, so we did use a booking agent. After that, we just kind of kept the contacts with all these places, and we personally book all these gigs now. It takes like a lot of work, a lot of time, but well worth it so that we can be there for every minute of the planning of the gig, so we know what they expect from us and what we expect from them. But social media like Facebook and Spotify has helped fuel the whole thing. Without that, I don't think we'd be playing over there anymore, but all these people keep listening to us, and so they go to their local venue and they say, hey, you should book this American band, and then they book us. That's pretty much how it happens. We are a completely independent band, and I handle most of the management, but we kind of spread the duties out between the band members. Now, let's go back. Talk to me about how you first got your initial start in music. Yeah, the first start, our parents, Roy and I, were twin brothers. Our parents, well, our father is a bass player, and our mom is a flute player. So there was always instruments around, and they pushed for us to start taking piano lessons at age five, which we did for several years, and the great starting point, like a good like, gateway instrument, if you will. And then we went on to, to do some school band stuff, where I played the other, I played the trumpet, but I really wanted to play the drums, so I kept pursuing that on my own, took a couple lessons, had other people that were around me give me lessons and everything. We started doing that, and then before we realized it, we had a couple other friends, and we were like, hey, let's start one of these bands. And at first, we played just cover songs, you know, a lot of stuff by, like, The Clash, Van Morrison, you know, CCR, and then a lot of punk songs, like, we covered a lot of No Effects, you know, bands like that. A band called Lagwagon covered a bunch of their stuff. And then kind of evolved into learning a lot of Nirvana songs, and then we evolved into, you know, we always try to modernize ourselves. So, you know, we started listening to a lot of, like, hip-hop and 
rap and country and reggae and heavy metal, really anything that we could think of. And we start pulling elements out of all of those and try to make our overall sound. That's pretty much how we got started. And then just kept pushing. And then after a while, we got opportunities to be releasing music. And then that led to like radio play and then more gigs. And that's really how the tour we started now. Now, I'd like to go back. Can you talk about what sort of effect it's had on you coming from such a musical family? Yeah, I know that my parents are happy to see the music continue. But it's also been a struggle, you know, a lot of ups and downs with music, you know, which almost makes it more fulfilling. You know, you got to work harder to get something out of it. And, I mean, it's taken a lot of time away from personal lives and, and things like that, but we found a way of being able to balance family with still doing the music and, you know, still advancing. And now, when you guys first came together as a band, you were primarily playing cover songs. Can you talk about right. why that was something you guys did and, and the value and kind of why that was important? Yeah, I guess at the time, being that we were adolescents, a lot younger, we were just kind of searching, like, you know, we didn't like, you know, at the time we were like, well, we don't really like the classic rock, we don't really like the straight up classic country. You know, we we're almost not rebelling, but looking for what's that kind of music that really sits well with the younger people and stuff. And for us, it was with the punk. We had another guitar player in the band at the time, and he was really into, like, the No Effects, Flag Wagon, Green Day, and all those bands. So I think his his influence on us helped drive, drive the whole punk element at first. And then maybe we started getting too old to keep playing punk, so we had to like slow it down a little bit. Now let's talk about your band. Can you say the name and then also who is the current members of the band? Sure. They yeah, were called The Breezeway. And our current lineup is my brother Roy, he does the, a lot of the vocals and guitar work. I play the drums. Um, Chrissy Reed, he does a lot of vocals, tambourine, plays acoustic guitar. And Bernie Shuttler, he's been the bass player now for a couple years with us. And we have a, like an MC hype man named IR. He helps like, he does a lot of raps and he helps work the crowd up. He's really good at like being able to talk to the crowd when, when we like fail at that. And what genre of music do you consider the Breezeway to be? And also, how would you describe the music that you guys create? Yeah, um, we're pretty much considered an alternative rock band. But we really do encompass elements of hip-hop, country, some heavy metal stuff. We're always looking for new sounds. We've done, this is our 16th album. So it's tough for us to consistently keep coming up with new music that doesn't just sound like the last album or the album before that. So you guys have done 16 albums. That's incredible. How, how have you been able to stay, to stay focused and stay motivated to keep creating new music? Yeah, I'd say that the big part is when we finally learned how to record ourselves properly and we ended up with some decent recording gear to record it, that's given us the flexibility to take longer on recordings, more at our own time, but also, like, we don't have the overhead a lot of bands do. Because we create all of our own music and our own music videos, so we're not having to spend a lot of money out. So, I mean, I think that's helped a lot. Where, you know, we're not, people aren't expected to pay for studio time and all that stuff. We work on our own pace, we work around everyone else's schedules, you know, we try to keep the conflict down. And the group of people we have in our band right now, they're also all of our friends. I mean, we all work together and stuff, but we really are friends at the same time, and it's really working out nice right now. And why would you say that that's something that's important, that everyone in the band are friends rather than hired, hired musicians? Musicians, and it's nice that nobody gets on anyone's nerves, and that little things don't end up 
we're spiraling out of creating something bigger. So, I mean, it's, it's important for us, for everyone to get along very well and be friends. I mean, it's like friends first and then band second, really. I mean, we do take it pretty serious and stuff, but and we haven't really done much hired out. I mean, we do collaborations with people, but this band is sort of set up that everybody kind of um, decides their own level of involvement. So, I mean, if somebody really wants to do more, they can do more if they, on the song. If they want to do less, they can do less. And, Nobody really gripes about it. Every, everyone works together very well. And I think that's been an important thing for this formation for the last five or, five or six years. Having the core. I mean, we changed out bass players, but it's been nice lately. Everyone's working together very nice. And, and I think it shows in the music when everyone's working together well. Now, what would you say makes the music that the Breezeway creates different from other bands or other artists? Um, well, we, for one, we don't try to stereotype ourselves into a certain genre at all. We may say, well, it's alternative rock. That's because we just don't really have a better name for it. So, I mean, one thing is that we're constantly bringing other sounds into our music. Sounds that maybe we at first think that wouldn't work. But then once we give it a whirl and add a you know, maybe, like, we'll take a sample from something and then add a real guitar on it. Try to create something that's a little bit different than what we've done before, maybe what anyone else has done. Which, there's been so much music created at this point by all these bands that it's really tough to find, like, a new sound someone hasn't already done. Now, you mentioned that your band experiences with a wide variety of songs. So let me ask you, what music or artists have influenced you? All right, well, personally, I mean, I've been a big fan of, like, bands like Candlebox, Bloodhound Gang, even Bone Thugs and Harmony, and a, a lot of wide variety of, of groups. Up Nirvana. You know, I always listen to a lot of um, CCR. And what about the groups and the artists that you just named has stood out or, or has had an impact on you? Oh, yeah. Like, um, for instance, like Bloodhound Gang, we're always a, a big fan of them. They, they were kind of like a, a rap, rock, comedy kind of band. But we were always a huge fan of them, and we had gone and seen them play concerts and everything. And, and then for us, the amazing thing is that um, we ended up doing a collaboration with a DJ from that group, DJ Cubal. He added like some scratch boards to our song called After Lessons Learned, which was on our last album. And for us, that was a huge milestone. We're like, man, you know, we've seen this guy playing like in amphitheaters. We're all the way out in the back. And and then he also went on, um, like DJ Cubal also books us gigs now out in like eastern Pennsylvania where he's kind of located at. And so for us, that was a huge milestone, for, you know, being able to collaborate with a group that we looked up to. Same thing with Bone Thugs and Harmony. They're a, they were a, or they, they are a rap group that was based out of Cleveland, Ohio. And then we ended up collaborating with Lazy Bone, one of the rappers in that group. And again, it was like such a huge milestone, being like, wow, this is another group we truly looked up to. And then we ended up creating music with them. And then the same thing with um, this new album. It has uh, Peter Klett playing guitar. He's the original guitarist of Candlebox. They had a bunch of heads back in the 90s. And again, it was like mind-blown that he would even want to work with us. Someone like that probably gets hit up by a lot of bands and stuff. So it, make, it, it humbles us down like when we get to work with the people that when we were little kids, we were looking up. And I think that's been driving us to keep going with the music. Wow, that that's incredible. Can you talk about how you how it came about that you were able to collaborate with with some really really big name artists? Yeah, um, I'll go back to the Bloodhound Gang one with um DJ Cubal. He had heard one of our like we do a lot of different types of songs, and some of the songs are Halloween songs, even like we do like Christmas songs, Halloween. And we had done a Halloween song where it's kind of like a, a rap Halloween song. He'd heard that and really liked it. 
and was asking about adding to that song. We were like, well, you know, we've already released it and everything, but we've got this other song. And so basically just through Facebook, we were able to do that collaboration. And then he ended up booking us at some clubs that he may have partial ownership in or something. But So that was, that was pretty nice, too, being like, well, he's actually booking us for gigs. They had just through um, the social media, like, brought that one around. Actually, with all these collaborations, it's been social media, it's been just the fact of the music getting out there, some of these people are hearing it. And with Lazy Bone, I, I did contact him about doing a collaboration, and he was right away receptive about it. And that's what we do, you know, we take chances. When, it, it takes a while sometimes, you know, we're thinking, like, well, we don't want to write this guy and say, hey, do you want to collaborate with us? He's just not going to write back, or he's going to write back and be like, well, you guys are too small of a band, or whatever. But, yeah, he wrote back right away and said yes, he'd love to collaborate. And then, same thing with the guitar player from Candlebox, Roy, my brother, like, set that one up. And it was someone he idolized, because he's a guitar player. He's like, you know what, I'm just going to write him. It's worth taking a chance. You're not out anything other than, you know, your time, if, if people don't want to work with you, but... You never know unless you just go for it. Could you briefly describe the music making process? Yeah, a lot of the times my brother will start on the guitar, usually like the acoustic or the classical, and he'll just kind of come up with a riff or, a, or like a jam, like a structure, if you will, and then, then what we'll do is from there we'll figure out what the BPM is, the timing of the song which, you know, sometimes we have like a, a little thing you can just tap out while the guitar is happening and it'll let you know what the BPM is. Then we'll throw a, like a click track in there, sort of like a, a metronome, but we always like to put like a fake beat in there as opposed to just your standard metronome making the beat. And then that way you have something to keep you on time. And then Roy will add the acoustic guitar and then Bernie will come over and add the bass. And then we'll start, then from that point, we'll start thinking, like, you know, what words or melodies kind of match this? You know, if we don't have something that we already have been coming up with. And then we'll start, once the words are taken care of, then we'll start layering down, usually like choruses first, and then adding verses. And then typically I'll add the drum set last. Once everything's in there, I kind of overdub the drums, using that um, flick track as, as keeping me on time. And then once the drums are recorded, then I'll, we'll delete the click track. We'll make it inactive so that you can just hear the authentic drums and stuff, unless it's a song that needs like a beat. Then from there, once it's recorded, we will edit up tracks, make sure if there's any extra sounds, like you know, nuances that you don't want in there or something. Then we'll do a remix, which basically we just pull all the levels down to zero on all these tracks. And then we just start with like the kick drum and work our way up through everything until we have a good solid mix of the song. Then that'll get bounced down from Pro Tools, usually what we're working out of. Then from there, we'll have a mastering session. And that's just to get the song up, the, the loudness, the match, like other artists being released and everything. And, and that's really the technical part of it. From there, though, we'll you know, we'll, we'll give copies to other people in the band, even our parents. We'll give them copies and let them listen. We'll be like, hey, you know, give us a critique on this. Do you think the drums sound clean enough, or do you think that vocal's loud enough? And we really just sit back and then take all the all the info that comes back in about that, and then we'll see if anything needs changed with the song. And if not, then it gets added to a playlist, and then we start up another song. Wow, that's a really um, in-depth process with a lot of moving parts. So how long does it take you guys from start to finish to create a song? Um, well, like this album itself has taken about four years. But sometimes, it, I mean, that's because we were also doing some touring and a lot of gigs and everything. If we were just focusing on it, we'd probably get a song done in about... I don't know, maybe a month. But we'll be working on several songs at, at any given point. But yeah, this album has taken about four years for since we've recorded the first song until we've recorded the last song. 
but that was because there was so much else going on that we just weren't spending all that time recording. Now, with so many moving parts in the recording process, what are some of the challenges that you guys have run into? It, like one of the one of the challenges we've ran into is um, you wouldn't really think of at first, but it's like space for backing up stuff. Because every time you work these sessions and everything, eventually when you're done with them, you want to save everything. And so you, know, you also want to save it in a couple of different places, not just in one external hard drive. So maybe you want to save it in three different places. But after so many albums, and we do produce other people's music as well, so we end up with you know, a lot of external hard drives that are just filled with Pro Tool sessions and WAV files and press releases and and even radio ads. We do a lot of the radio IDs where, you know, you record and you say, like, hey, you're listening to whatever station. And so really, like, being able to back up all this stuff and making sure that we keep copies in case we need it probably been one of the bigger challenges, but still, that's not been that much of a challenge, just making sure we always have a place to save and stuff in multiple places. And now you're a producer and also an engineer. Um, can you talk to me about what you like about using Pro Tools? Yeah, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm partial to Pro Tools only because that was what all these studios we've been going to, we've been, we had seen people using the Pro Tools, and then we had gone to audio engineering school in Nashville, and they focused on Pro Tools and a program called Logic, which is a really good program as well. We, we actually use both. And it really just depends. You know, sometimes we'll use Logic for like samples and you know the click tracks and stuff. But for Pro Tools, it's been nice because it really is. Once you learn it, it's really easy to use, and it's very easy to uh, to take to another studio. If you want to start here, like in our studio, and we're like, well, we want someone else to mix it, or we want to go somewhere else, somewhere else to record the drums. It's really easy to. Uh, to take to another studio. Now, being that you're you're a drummer and you you play physical instruments, why were you interested and why was it important for you to go to engineering school? Well, I, we had done recording before that, but I, I really wanted to learn the finer basics of it. And I really needed to learn, like you know. Because I would learned how to play drums, but I really didn't learn that technical. Like, I didn't really even know what an 8 beat was, or, you know, I didn't know what a 120 BPM was at the time. So, I mean, I could play the drum set along the guitar players and stuff, but it really did help my technical ability by learning all that stuff. And at the same time, you know, we learned, you know, how to, how to make a track sound better, how to clean it up, what EQs to use, what compressors to use when to use reverb, when to use delay. And this was, I mean, that, that's probably stuff that a lot of people could know on their own. It was stuff that we had to go to school to learn. And, and it helped us a lot. We were already living in Nashville. So that helped us too. We were recording a lot of people. and It just brought our skills up higher. We learned a bunch more. Okay, now I want to talk about your upcoming album. Can you tell me the name of the upcoming album, and then I'm going to ask you individually about the four singles that your band has released. Yeah. All right, um, the new album is going to be called Bits and Bobs, and that was a term that we had heard getting thrown around a lot over in England. You know, like the one lady, she was always saying, oh, I'm going to the, to the market to get some bits and bobs. We finally asked, hey, what are bits and bobs? And that's just sl like slang for this and that. And, and it really seemed to really captivate this album that we just finished up. It really is a lot of bits and bobs. It's a lot of this and that. Different types of songs, different collaborations. And now talk to me about the single, Gone Away. Talk about the creation process and some of the themes and topics that you guys cover. Oh yeah, like, for that song, we wanted to keep it really simple. Because we... We already had the idea that we knew we wanted to pay homage to loved ones that we had lost, or loved ones that other people had lost. So 
first the, the first idea with that song was we wanted to keep the music really simple so there's like one guitar you know one beat and then a bass maybe a little bit of strings in the background but it wasn't really layered up like the way some of our other songs are they'll have like you know, ball guitars and stuff but so for that song we also asked our like fans and friends to send us pictures of their loved ones that they missed or they've lost and they did and we created a music video from it i think it's our most like i don't know heartfelt video it's really simple like i didn't put a lot of i created a lot of the videos for us but that was a really easy one to throw together no special effects nothing like that just pictures of people and then little images of us performing music so that song it really means a lot to us because it's probably the most heartfelt song that we've put out yeah that's a that's a super creative uh concept for a music video can you talk about the experience of creating and releasing really personal music yeah like sometimes we'll write songs that are really personal and you know it's like taking a piece of us and letting other people know about it and stuff and sometimes we'll you know the lyrics may get like generalized as not to be too specific so they can be sort of taken any different directions it's always kind of a scary thing when you take something that's inside of you that's something very emotional and you put it out there for people to see because people are going to react different some are going to love it some are going to hate it but with that with that song it's been incredibly like nothing but positive I mean, there's been some issues with our music different labels coming after us before for things but, but as far as that song it's been really nice because we used a sample in that song gone away and so did um, a french singer over in France, and her name's Caroline Costa, and her record label, Warner Brothers, tried coming after us wanting to shut that song down. They thought that we had ripped her off. But in all reality, we had just used the same free sample. I mean, there are some things when doing a band, like when you, you wouldn't think in a million years that some of these big labels would keep such an eye on you, but they do. But it's also, it's motivation for us to keep everything lined up very nice and yeah, Gone Away has worked out really nice. People have responded well to it. Now talk to me about the song, Someone's Got Soul. Oh yeah, Someone's Got Soul. That's the second single from this new album, Heads and Bobs. And for that one, we wanted to... People have been writing us and they're like, you know, hey, you don't put up a lot of pictures from being in the studio. You don't put up a lot of videos while you're recording. Because a lot of the times we try not to record people while they're recording so that we're not messing with them while they're recording. But for that one, the whole idea was we wanted to reenact the recording process. So we just reenacted kind of how we had recorded it in a way. Of course, we generalized it way down and didn't show all the steps or anything. But And then that was a collaboration as well. A guitar player in England named Mike Gruber, he played all the solos and leads on Someone's Got Soul. He, also, he played bass for us on the last UK run. He's been an awesome I guess UK Breezeway member. And now you guys did a cover song as well. Can you talk about the creation process of that and some of the themes and topics you guys cover on that song? Yeah. This was a song called 16 Tons. I think the first famous artist that did that was Tennessee Ernie Ford. But it was written by someone else. Merle Travis was the songwriter for that. So it, it was nice. We, you know, we listened to a few versions of the song until we found the one we thought was closest to what we want to do. So then we recorded a version. But in order to officially get it out there and stuff, you have to like request a license to release a cover song when someone else has the copyright on it. And it was a great experience. We sent the thing in, and it was less than a day. They responded back saying, "Yeah, yeah we think that's great. You can cover." Can cover this song. It'd be like the family of the guy that wrote the thing originally. So they, they agreed to it, and so we're like, right away, we threw together a music video where we just sort of showed us doing like minimal work, like driving around a tractor and you know, digging holes and stuff. Real basic kind of stuff, but trying to go along with that theme of like the 16 tons, it's like a coal mining song. It's about people breaking their back for the company to make more money. That was a fun 
music video. It was one of our themed ones where we acted like we were like farmers and stuff. And now let's talk about the song Breathe. Yeah, Breathe. That music video is coming out tomorrow. And that was a collaboration with a band called Old Face Lies. They're a heavy metal band from Lisbon, Ohio, which is really close to where we're at. And we work with a lot of those guys from time to time on, on songs and projects. So that was a really nice one. And it's probably this music video has the most effects that we've used so far. There was a lot going on in it. A lot of you know shakiness with the camera. A lot of these weird colors coming off of people and stuff. But again, that's just kind of reflective as we learn more about making videos. The videos will get better because we do all of our own stuff now. We've had one, I think our one video was made by BP Visuals but other than that we've done all the rest of the videos now you guys have also created a documentary can you talk about the process yeah like that was fun like we had the idea that you know for the last um, UK run that we had done which was in 2017 we were like you know and then there was, there was a local businessman here in our town he's like you know People might want to see what it's like. Because he was saying, he's like, yeah, you know, everybody seen the videos and stuff of famous musicians going around, like the big famous musicians going around. And they always have the nice tour buses, nice hotels. And the guy giving us the idea is like, you know, people might want to see what it's like to rough it as an independent band that's still getting out there and stuff, but, you know, it doesn't have the luxuries that some of the big famous artists. So that was really the thing was it was just showing our experience and how we go through and how we treat it like the gigs as a job but we also make sure it's like a vacation as well you know we suck up the culture we learn from people try to better ourselves from those experiences and that's pretty much what this documentary shows and there'll be another one next year and it'll be documentary documenting like april and may of next year what song or kind of music is your favorite to perform? Um, for myself, hmm, it's hard to tell. Um, I, I always like, I like how when we play live, our sets are a little bit more heavy, a little bit more rocking than what the recordings are. Like for a song, we have a song called Get It Poppin'. Which I, I love to perform, and it's usually one we use as like the first song of the set because it has a bit of an intro to it. But it also it, it really captures the the rock elements with the rap elements, and it, it's just a nice when it's talking about getting the party started right. It really sets the mood for the night. If it's you know, depending on what kind of gig it is, it, for me maybe get it popping, maybe my favorite one to play. As far as Breezeway songs go, we do a lot of cover songs. And stuff too sometimes, but probably get a pop is my favorite. Now, what are your music career goals, and what as a group would you like to achieve with Breezeway? Well, we really hope to continue what we're doing right now, but also at the same time, you know, expand to some more markets, expand to some other places. You know, think of you know, also trying to keep up in the modern technology things. There's always something new. There's like a new platform to work off, a new business strategy. And we're always trying to learn, but our main goal is just to keep the band running, keep putting music out, and hopefully keep enjoying it. Now, being that you've been a part of releasing 16 albums, working with a bunch of different musicians, what's a piece of advice that you could give to an aspiring band or a band who's just getting started in their music career? Yeah, that's it. A big thing is to work with whoever you can. As long as you know that it's a good move. Because a lot of the times, like, the people you meet on the way up are the same ones you meet on the way down. And so really, don't ever, you know, well, don't ever close the door on a good opportunity unless you've really researched it. Sometimes the smallest little thing could end up spiraling into something way bigger and it's hard to really think what advice because it, the technology and everything changes so rapidly nowadays that we're 
we're like always trying to stay up on stuff. We're not always the first to know what the new way of doing things are. But yeah, treat everyone with respect, treat them nice, and they will they will return the favor big time. And that's what we've noticed. You know, we treat everyone nice, and people treat us even nicer. And it's really kept us going. So I'd say the best advice is just to work with whoever you can, give everyone a shot. You never know who it's going to come along that's going to help you out that much more. Can you share your social media links? Yeah. Um, primarily, I'd say like Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, um, iHeart Music, and iHeart Radio. Pretty much all of those platforms we're on. I don't think we're on Twitter or Instagram, but if yeah, make sure you find us on YouTube and, and Facebook and Spotify. Those are the big ones. Is there anyone you'd like to acknowledge for offering financial or emotional support to you in your music career? Yeah, I definitely want to thank our parents. They've been incredibly supportive with the band, and also a guy named Bob Siva here in town. He's a businessman that financially has helped us out a lot with sponsorships and things. That we couldn't, have, couldn't ask for a better friend, for sure. But plus, everyone who's listening, everyone who's ever come to one of our gigs, and thanks to you for interviewing me. Quite honored for that. Is there anything else you'd like to promote or share? Well, um, if you have an interest in audio engineering, my brother and I also wrote a book with the help of some other people, but we wrote a book about him recording. And it's called the Home Recording Manual, which you can find on Amazon and places like that. But, you know, it, it's a short book, but you know, we tried to really break it down to just the basics. So, I mean, if you're interested in trying to get good recording at home, then say feel free to check our book out. It's called the Home Recording Manual. All right, I'd like to give a very big thank you to my guests for joining me here today on the Creative Collective. As always, write your comments below. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this video. And for all of your promotion, marketing, and music career consulting needs, email ennisproductions at gmail.com.